Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner Podcast. The podcast where the doctorate is honorary and the friends are imaginary. Well, here we are, Mark Lesson 26 is what I got written down. And uh, we're going to try to get to the back half of this parable that Jesus is telling uh, without, you know, too many detours or distractions or, or uh, let's see what will start with D. Detours, distractions, or digressions. How about that, huh? I could be a famous preacher someday with alliteration like that. So, before, but you know, like I said, not too many of that. But first, before we get started, I want to tell you guys a story. So as, as many of you know, as some of you know, as one or two of you know, uh, we go up every month to the city of Brunswick, Georgia, and we preach out there during what they call the First Friday Festival. And it has been a, uh, um, well, we've been faithful. How about that? And uh, we've endured lots of persecution from the city. And uh, a particular is a person that's in charge of that festival that has seen fit to, you know, has straight up told us, you know, I, I'm not going to be happy until you're in jail. And uh, anyway, she's she's done a lot of things to make it more difficult for us. And one of the things she she has been doing uh, has they they had this big Shriner bus down there, and the Shriners have this you know this big white bus, and they're just gathering money for raising money for something. I don't, I don't know what they're doing there. A bunch of guys in you know red fez hats with Muslim symbols in the front, and uh, they so they stand there and they tell uh, so they 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 park they were parking right where um, we preached like like literally like in front of the on top of the sidewalk where we would normally stand where we stood for years and this was this lady's attempt to get rid of us was to put something there so we couldn't stand there. Okay, fine. So then she instructed the uh, Shriner people to use their stereo in their bus to drown us out. Okay, fine. And they've taken to playing ACDC's Highway to Hell when they see us. They see us coming. Uh, we go to a di slightly different spot across the street now because there's just no sense in standing right underneath somebody's billion watt stereo and try to get anything done. Uh, I'm stubborn, but I'm not stupid. So we go to the next corner over, and when they see us setting up, they start playing ACDC's Highway to Hell at top volume over and over and over. Actually, but Friday night, they were, they were alternating between... Um, ACDC and the SpongeBob SquarePants uh, theme song, which is a weird choice of of mixes there. But anyway, so uh, after a while of you know dealing with that, we said we're going to go about a block down away from all this. There's a bunch of people down here. We're going to go down. And we're going to preach to them. So we went across the street from this this restaurant slash brewery thing, and for probably thirty minutes or so, we we preached outside this place to the crowd that was assembled, waiting to go in or whatever they were doing. There were people that were standing there the whole time. And there are people that we had run into on the other side of things that were now um, at this brewery place getting food or whatever. So they got to hear us again, and, and what a blessing that was. Um, but there's a guy there who who stood there the whole time and just kind of eyeballed us, giving me the you know the high, the hairy eyeballs we used to say, and uh, he wasn't a fan. And uh, so he just stood there, didn't say nothing, just looked at us real mad, like that's gonna do something, and. Uh, if I'm distracted uh, in my podcasting, it's because I'm watching a a flock of guineas uh, being chased by a goat. You won't get that sort of you won't get that sort of that sort of color commentary just any place in the podcasting world. I, I kid you not. Anyway, so um, the guineas aren't mine, but the goat is, and the guineas just kind of they just kind of do guinea things. So we got done uh, preaching, you know, it was uh, getting late, it was like 8.30 or so, and, and uh, you know, we've been out there for a couple hours by now, and for, for two guys to preach on a corner for an hour is, is a big undertaking, for to go beyond that is, is really, it's just, you get to a point where your 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 brain is, you know, in a slurry, and uh, so we're packing our stuff up, and the guy chooses at this point to yell, go home, to which I replied, I'm trying, and he said, you understand that we hate you, and I said, yeah, yeah, I understood that. He says, well, you understand nobody here wants you here. I said, yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. He said, well, you understand you're an idiot or something to that effect. And I said, well, your problem, sir, is the Bible says light's coming to the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. The problem you have with the gospel, the problem you have with me is the gospel. And the problem you have with the gospel is the is the is is because you love your sin more than you love your very own soul. And uh, he didn't much appreciate that. And uh, he told me, you know, a couple of things that he thought I should do and some places he thought I should go and everything. 
And I said, man, you really had to repent, man. You got, you got some deep, dark heart issues and everything. And, uh, so, uh, he began to get more and more abusive and he was standing there, you know, uh, facing me with his, his wife was in between me and him facing him. So that's all I could see was her back. And I said, well, you, you know, you want to talk to me to come over and talk like a man, or you can stand over there and hide behind your wife. And, uh, he opted to leave and, uh, and you say, well, you shouldn't talk to people that way. Well, uh, I don't always talk to people that way. In fact, I would go so far to say that I don't usually talk to people that way. Uh, but had you been there, I think you would have had a more of a feel for what was actually going on. And so I'll just leave it at that. But I tell you what's hard in that sort of in industry or in, 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 in that sort of instance is it is rough uh, having a burden for somebody who doesn't have a burden for themselves. We did not go down there to pick a fight with that guy. We did not go down there to argue with that guy. We went down there to preach the gospel to that fellow because he desperately needs Jesus Christ. And um, and he does not care that he needs Jesus Christ. And it is tough to watch hardness in the face of people for whom Christ died and for people for whom Christ bled for. And the older I get, it doesn't get easier. It gets harder. And on that note, Mark 4. Now in Mark 4, just as a quick recap, Jesus is telling his first parable. And a man, it's a doozy. So he's speaking to a mixed multitude there. He's in a boat. You see that in uh, verse uh, uh, Mark 4, verse 1. And he began again to teach about the seaside. and was a gathering of great multitudes. So they entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. So mixed multitude. Being, uh, you know, he had the people that were there were his friends, people there were his believers, people there were his followers, and people there who were his enemies. And uh, here, he, in the in this parable, he used a real world example, a story that anybody could understand, anybody that had done any amount of living. And uh, he used a real world example where everything, uh, where every element of the story represents something else. We talked about that. We talked about that several times. It feels like anyway. Um, and so I, I think, I was trying to think in my brain without looking up every single parable. I think it's only one of two parables where he actually explains uh, the different elements of the parable. And, to, and you walk over that with, you know, without having to run any references, uh, you, you, you walk away from that with a, a clear idea of what he's trying to say. But we're going to look at verse 7. We covered the first two, I think. Yeah, first two. Uh, last time, and I talked way too much about whatever. Uh, verse 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Now, verse 7 corresponds to verse 18 and verse 19. Verse 18 says, And these are they, this is explanation, These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it become unfruitful. Now, there's a, there's a lot in there. So I'm going to refer to these groups as, I don't know, like first group, second group, third group. I don't know what else to call them. So in the first group, or the first example, we're going to say, the, that seed really never had a chance. I mean, he throws it out by the wayside, and, and immediately the devil goes in and begins to steal the steal the seed out of the hearts of men, steal the word out of the hearts of men, however that works. And in the second example, um, the seed tried to sprout. I mean, it's a little closer to the goal, but, uh, you know, or, or, or at least the point of sowing seed. You don't, you don't sow seed to feed the bird. You sow seed to feed yourself. Uh, so it, in, in example two, the group, you know, at least you get a little plant there, but it's not. There's no root there. It says in, the, in the passage. So it's the beginning of it, closer to the goal, uh, but still not good enough. In the third example, it looks to me like the seed takes root, but apparently, uh, that in and of itself is, is not is is not sufficient for what you would call a successful Christian life. I will freely admit, uh, there's a couple of these examples, a couple of these groups where the interpretation of it is a little dicey, and I will go through why I think it's one way and not the other. I talked before why I thought the second group wasn't saved at all, because they have no root, and, and Jesus is the root of Jesse, and without root you can't get the water, and well, Jesus is the water of life, and all that stuff I talked about before. This third group is actually, I'll tell you why, well, okay, so so it doesn't say... So the second example, there's no root. So there's no root means no Jesus, which means you're not saved. Okay, fine. It doesn't say the third group didn't have a root. 
But apparently, even if you have a root, you're not out of the woods yet. Okay? And I know there are people listening to that that are going to hear something I didn't say. And so if I'm choosing my words sort of carefully, that's why. Because at the end of the day, I can't control what you hear. I can only control what I say. And I don't even do a super great job of that all the time. But um, so it also says that not that it grew up among thorns, but that it was sown among the thorns. In other words, thorns were already there when the seed was thrown on the ground, when it was sowed out. So then what what in that, what does that mean? Now it would be easy to run over to a very similar parable, the one in Matthew 13, and sort of borrow some of those definitions, offer another parable, and apply them here. And, and a lot of people do that. They run over to Matthew 13 and they say, well, you know, the sower is the, is the son of God. Okay, and okay, fine. But then you, you start really, if you lay these parables out and you lay them side by side, you realize that some of these things don't, even though it's the same elements in the story, they represent different things. So you got to be really, uh, really careful. And so it would be easy to do that. It would also be careless. It would also be dangerous because, like I said, none of the, some of the same elements in both parables have different, different stand-ins. They, they represent different things. It would be easy to say that the field is the world, but that's, that's about as much liberty as I feel like I can take in, in, in borrowing definitions there. We know, let's just, let's just stick with what we know, all right? So, so if you don't know something, it helps to start from what you do know and build from there. And you never interpret a vague passage in light of a clear passage. I'm sorry, you never vague, what was I trying to say? You never, you never cause something you don't understand to make you doubt something you do understand, okay? Um... But we know from Mark 4 that the, that the soul is the various, you know, heart conditions of men. And the question could be asked, if the sower knows what he's doing, I mean, assuming he's not a competent boob, uh, then the, why is the field that he's sowing in in such crummy shape? I, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, we grow a little garden or whatever and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I would not say I'm a farmer. I got, you know, I got some livestock or whatever. I got these two idiot goats and everything. And actually, at this point in life, I'm just waiting for all the animals to die off so I cannot replace them and be done. But if I'm out sowing, I may accidentally throw some out into the wayside. Let me, let me tell you, sir, this is my only experience with sowing, really. Uh, we had, a, we had a, a little backyard area. I'm pointing like you can see where I'm pointing. But we had a little backyard area where we had a horse. And uh, why do we have a horse? Because I had a daughter. And that's how that worked. And uh, that, the expression uh, "eats like a horse" that's that's an expression for a reason. Um, a horse will eat you out of house and home. And and anyway, we had this thing in this little backyard, area, a little backyard fenced-in area. And in short order, this horse—it wasn't even like a full-size horse. It was like someone had left this horse in the dryer for too long. It was a little bitty thing. It was the sort of thing that a little girl could ride around. Okay. That's the sort of horse. It's the sort of horse when you go to these festivals and fairs that they they got the horse tied to a, a like a little uh, you know spinny thing and they walk around in circles. Actually, that's what this horse had done earlier in its life. And if you tied this horse to a tree, it would walk in a circle around all day long. Because that's what that's what they do. Anyway, so I put this horse in this little backyard area, and in short order, this horse ate this ate the backyard area down to the ground, down down to the dirt, right. And so what we did, we moved him over to another section of the property to let him eat that down to the dirt. And uh, no, no, that, was, that wasn't the goal. Um, he just he ate the grass way faster than we thought he would. And all of a sudden we got like no grass back there. So I said, uh, my wife says, well, I don't want whatever's going to grow back from, you know, whatever. Where I live, if you just let things grow, it'll grow back. It'll be green, but it won't be grass necessarily. It'll be some other thing. It won't be the lush green lawn that people want for some reason so she said i don't want this i don't want this uh you know uh don't want it just to grow to fill in from the outside she said let's go get some grass seed and we can uh just throw some grass seed back there and and there you go and it'll grow and it'll be great so i went and bought some grass seed and she took it upon herself my lovely wife to to uh um to throw the seed back there but my wife is not what you would call an outdoorsy kind of person she was in her younger life, but when you go to when you move to Georgia and it's 104 degrees, you know, it cools the your affection for the outdoors. Anyway, so so she said, I said, so did you ever uh, throw that seed in the backyard? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And when the so when the seed came up, 
what you had, if you stood on the, the last remaining piece of pavement in the backyard, what you had is this lush, green, sort of half circle of grass. Because what she had done is she had she hadn't walk, walked out into the dirt and thrown thrown the grass uh, seed everywhere. She had stood right where she was comfortable and threw it as far as she could and threw the whole bag out in that one little area where she was standing. So you had this beautiful, lush, incredibly thick uh, a half circle that immediately surrounds and was the exact uh, you know limit of her of her throwing range. And that's because, in all due you know respect to my wife. She did not know what she was doing. But here in the parable of the sower, we have to assume that the, that the sower knows what he's doing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, we're, I'm, I'm not, as, as someone who sow, is going to sow a seed, I'm not going to on purpose throw seed among the thorns. So I got to this part of scripture when I was, when I was going through all this stuff. And I was like, why, why wasn't the field prepared? I mean, you know, one of the things that you, you get ready to plant anything, uh, uh, sowing or regular planting, you know, digging a hole in the ground, putting a seedling, whatever you're going to do, you have to prepare the ground. The ground has to be broken up because, uh, you know, roots, when they first come out, they're not that strong and they need lots of loose soil to get, you know, get the stick their little tendrils out. And, 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 and that's just a necessity. They need the ground to be broken up for them. Ground that just sits there gets compacted by rain and, and gravity and life and people walking on it and, and whatever else, and so you have to bust that ground up so that there's some there's some looseness to the soil. I, if you don't know about this stuff, I don't know what to tell you except just you know figure it out. Um, so so I thought about this and I said, okay, there are, I would I would not go plant seeds in a place that had not been prepared. I would not go plant. I personally would not go sow seed in a place that was covered in thorns because what you would expect to get is exactly what the sower gets, and if the sower is the son of man. Why didn't the sower prepare the field better? Is the question that I asked myself. He went out to a field and he worked a field where that field was, for the most part, unprepared for anything to grow. There's got to be some kind of preparation. Somebody has to bust up the ground. Somebody has to do all that stuff. And, and, and part of that prep work is getting rid of thorns. But look, the thorns are already there. When the seed hits the ground. So why didn't the sower prepare the field better? I mean, you ever think about that? Okay, so now now listen close, okay? Because uh, it's going to sound like I'm trying to let Jesus off the hook. Uh, Jesus does not need me to let him off the hook. If the sower in the story is Jesus, and it's safe to assume that it is, or, or, or by extension, anyone who's doing the work that Jesus assigned them to do. Okay, go you out in the world and, and preach the gospel. Okay, fine. So it's either Jesus or some standing for Jesus, some co-laborer with the Lord. Okay, so listen close. The field, which is the hearts of men, and its preparation is not the sower's responsibility. In fact, tell you what, go with me to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. You're in your Old Testament, 1 Samuel 7. Because I started thinking about this thing of preparing things, of preparing the ground, of preparing the heart, preparing, 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 okay? Because the ground here in Mark 4 is not very well prepared. Mark 7. I'm sorry, Mark 7. Mark, uh, 1 Samuel 7. And the verse one, and the men of Kerjathjearim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Benadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kerjathjearim that the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. And prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So you, you see that? God was going to do a thing. God was going to do a thing that he had already promised he was going to do. 
And God was going to do a thing, and it wasn't God's job to prepare the people's hearts. It was the people's job to prepare their own hearts. Look at Isaiah 40. With all apologies to my Calvinist brethren, who I love dearly, and who I admire in oh so many ways, the idea that God has removed from man all his responsibility towards salvation is not correct. The idea that I'm, the idea that a man contributes something to a salvation, that's not what I'm saying. But the idea that man contributes nothing to his salvation, he's just sort of this blank slate that God does whatever he wants to, that's just not the Bible model. Isaiah, what did I say? Isaiah 40, verse 3. No, I'm sorry, verse, yeah, here we go. Uh, we'll start at verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, say your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity of the Lord, uh, her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So was it God's responsibility to prepare his way? Or was it the people's responsibility? According to that verse, and that's the verse that, that John the Baptist preaches in his ministry as as the forerunner of Jesus Christ. That's 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 the that and he tells me he goes out into people and he looks them in their face and he tells them that they have a responsibility to prepare themselves for what God's fixing to do. It's the same message, it's the same deal. Look at Amos 4. Now, this ties into this story that I told at the beginning of this, if you think about it. Amos 4, verse 12. Therefore, thus, to verse 11, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a fire brand plucked out of the burning, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. So God notifies people, I'm about to do a thing. And when I do a thing, you'd better be ready. And the responsibility is on you to be ready. So God gives you truth, or God puts you on notice, and then God holds you accountable for what you do. That soul in the parable, Mark 4, is men's hearts. And most of the men in this story were woefully and terribly unprepared for what God wanted to do. We go out there and with this guy, this guy that was yelling at us at first Friday, he was woefully unprepared for what God wanted to do. God wanted to save that man. God wanted to extend mercy to him. God wanted to restore fellowship to him through the blood of Jesus Christ. God wanted to uh, adopt that man as his son and give him life and life everlasting. And that man's heart was so choked over and so hardened and so unprepared. And there are people that we preach to, speaking just personally, me and Darnell, we have preached to people for 10, 15, 20 years, the same people over and over again, looked them in their face. I could look at them through the windshield and recognize them. I preached to them. I preached to their kids. And a message, and Darnell likes to say this out there, the message is always the same. And you've heard it, and you've heard it, and you've heard it. And you're not ready. you got nobody to blame but yourself. Jeremiah preached 26 years in Jerusalem. Every day, it looks like. And when the things started going sideways in Jerusalem, they still weren't ready. So in this third example, the thorns are there because the man who had been tasked with preparing his own heart had failed to get rid of the thorns. And the thorns, according to verse 19, are the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things. And these things apparently won't keep you from getting saved, but will prevent you from doing anything for Jesus. Because the people in the story, they have root. They have Jesus. 
but they're choked out by the things that were already there before they got saved and that continued to grow after they got saved. And we have all got a little bit of that in our field. But you ever think about why in this story, if everything is a stand-in for everything else, right, then the fact that it's thorns and not, you know, kudzu or something is significant. Look at, look at Genesis 3. Good old Genesis 3. Everything that is wrong with you, everything that is wrong with me, is in Genesis 3. And we're going to look at verse... Uh, 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Verse 18 says, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till I return to the ground. For out of it was, thy taken, was thou taken, for dust thou art, unto dust shalt thou return. So, Adam's failure in the garden not only made life harder, but it made salvation necessary. For as by one man sin into the world, and death by sin, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So, Adam's failure in the garden made salvation necessary, but it also made salvation difficult. And by that I mean this, a man hears the gospel, and sometimes the devil is working against him. We see that in Mark 4. And sometimes that man is working against himself. And even after he is saved, sometimes he is working against himself. I have to sort of assume, uh, based on, I guess it doesn't really say it, so I'll just, I'll just say that I'm assuming this. And you can take it or leave it, whatever it's worth. But I'm assuming that some of those seeds sown among thorns never even sprouted. I'll tell you what I've seen. I have been preaching for 1995, so what is that, 28 years? Preached thousands of times, easily thousands of times. I mean, you just do the math. A couple hundred times a year, sometimes more. 20 plus years, you know, it adds up. So what I've seen since we started all this crazy journey that God's got us on is I have seen the cares, I've seen, I've seen apathy. Apathy is the sin of the day, at least when you go out in public and preach. People have, it's really strange so, so let's say 15 years ago, um, you would go out and preach, and people would get mad, and they'd get angry, and they'd sometimes get violent. And now sometimes people still get mad, they still get angry, they still get violent, but for the most part, they stare at their phones. It's a little insulting that I am, I am preaching, you know, 65, 70 decibels. Or whatever, uh, sorry, noise, noise, vo noise, noise ordinance violations are usually sixty-five decibels or eighty-five decibels, depending on where you're at, for a sustained period. So, so we've been we've been we've been clocked in the high fifties, low sixties. Um, but anyway, and I and, and you know, and the guy is standing three, four feet away from me, and he may look up at me every once in a while. And may stop and take a picture of me with his phone, but then he's going to look right back at his phone. And you could drive a freight train past that guy, and he would not hear it. He would not notice that it's there. People have become these electronically dependent, passive, screen-addicted zombies. And what to me that is, that's, that's the cares of this world. That's the, that's the deceitfulness of riches. That's the lust of other things. So you go out there to sow seed among those among those thorns, you can't prepare, you cannot, I cannot, as a sower, prepare the hearts of those people. Those people have responsibility to themselves to prepare to hear what God has to say. 
And man, the odds are just stacked against people getting saved. Even though it's what God wants, the odds are stacked against it. And uh, that same thing where people are apathetic, phone-addicted zombies, Christians have that same problem. L look, at, look at Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4. This is a key verse. If you're going to memorize a verse, this is something you ought to really get a hold of. First four, uh, Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The way you dress, the way you talk, the way you act, the way, well, your, the, your, your Bible reading, all that stuff is a reflection of your heart condition. And if you... If you came into this thing with a heart full of nonsense uh, and you still got saved, you're going to have to make an effort, a deliberate effort to prune out some of that nonsense or it's going to choke out and you'll be saved. But you'll never, you, you won't accomplish anything. So this third example, I, I, I think, and I, I, you know, I've rambled on enough about it, I guess, maybe. Um, is saved folks who had a bunch of junk in their life, and that junk just kept them from living for Jesus after they were saved. You know? Busy, busy, dreadfully busy. You've no idea what I've got to do. Busy, busy, dreadfully busy. Much too much busy for you. It's from the Theological School of Veggie Tales. That's what that is. So... Yeah, and keep in mind the purpose of sowing isn't so you can have plants. There's lots of ways to have plants. I'm looking at a bajillion plants in front of me. Purpose of sowing is not to have plants. The purpose of sowing is to have fruit. No one grows a garden to have plants. People grow a garden to have vegetables, right? I mean, this is right. And polls show you you can you can look at any poll you want. You can walk in and ask people yourself. Polls show that most Christians, Americans, I'm, I'm, I'm I guess, even in you know Bible believing circles, we're King James Bible, we're this, we're that, we're all dedicated and separated and you know in, independent, fundamental, temperamental, whatever. Even in those circles, most Christians never share the gospel with anyone, and that means, among other things, that all of us that are saved are the results of the evangelism of just a few people. I mean, I mean, a very small, I don't know, a few people, like, you know, three or four. I mean, a very small percentage of the body of Christ wins the rest of the body of Christ, which is kind of wild when you think about it. Of course, it makes sense, though. If, if you look at warfare, which the Christian life is compared to over and over again, yeah, so much for no distractions, so much for no rabbit trails, so much for no digressions, but here we are. If you look at the history of warfare, there's a, there's a book written, I um, can't think of the guy's name, the book was called uh, On Killing, and I found it to be a fascinating book because it explained, um, it explained some things about me to myself, and the guy did a survey, and he did all these studies on people who had killed people in combat, or people who had not killed people in combat, and he did a study of of all the, the psychological and physiological things that go on when you're about to take another human being's life. And, um, but anyway, he says in there, and he goes through all the numbers, and you go back in any war you want to look at, all the way back to, you know, ancient times, as far back as we've got records for, what you'll find is that most soldiers never fire their gun. Even in a combat situation, most soldiers never kill anybody. All the killing is done by you know, 10% or whatever, whatever the number is. He has a number and I don't remember what it is. And um, so most soldiers never fire their gun. <clears throat> and me, most Christians do, most Christians don't either. So I, I try to be transparent in all this. And uh, I have to tell you that for most of my saved life, when I read this parable in Mark 4, what I saw was three groups of lost people and one group of saved people. And I don't. I don't think it's that way anymore. I really. I have to rethink how, what I think. What I, because because a lot of it depends on what you define as 
fr- the fruit in the story, right? So, so if the fruit is uh, successful Christian living, let's just say that, then you can have a plant but not have any fruit. I've seen that with tomatoes, man. We we, we had a uh, we, we grew some tomatoes. I think it was last year, the year before, whatever it was. And we I mean these these things got big and they got bushy and they got full and there wasn't a flower on them. No flower, no fruit. So this tomato plant I grew, these tomato plants I grew, there was several. It just like that happened to all of them. I think I got three tomatoes off of like six or seven plants. It was just aggravating. Um but uh it was still a tomato plant. Right? So if you never do anything for Jesus, you're still a Christian. You're still saved. Your sins are still washed away. You still have eternal life. But I'm not trying to be mean here, but you're kind of useless. And it's also interesting to me, if, if, since we're going down that road, that Jesus is willing to grow plants that will never benefit him. And the reason he is willing to do that is because he is the good husbandman. I grow a tomato plant and it doesn't produce, to produce, to produce tomatoes, and I get a little cranky about it. And when Jesus grows a tomato plant and it doesn't produce any fruit, he prunes it, and he shapes it, and he tries to get it to produce fruit. But at the end of the day, you are responsible to cultivate your own heart. You are responsible for the fruit you produce for Jesus Christ. So what changed my mind to think that this third group of people is actually saved people who never did anything is this. So the, the second group has no root. We established all the typology there already. And, and the other reason we'll get to later. But the third group has a root apparently, and, but a root but no fruit. I'm going to show you some examples of that in Scripture, okay? So I'm not, not just making this up. I know what people say. They say, if you're not doing something for Jesus, it's probably because you're not saved. Well... I know some guys that say, if you don't preach on the street, you're not right with God. Okay, well, go live in Saudi Arabia and do that. I mean, you're going to stand there and tell it, look at those people in the face and say, you're not doing what I would do. If I, You know what I'm saying? Like, like, you have liberty. You should do what you have liberty to do. And you should be willing to go above and beyond what you have liberty to do. And, and trust God for the consequences. But to just say, here's this activity. You're not doing this activity that I think you should be doing. Then you're just, you're just a flop. Well, bless his heart. Okay. Just, I got to stop chasing things, man. I got to stay on track. So Romans 1, verse 13, is written to save folks, right? I mean, it's a church epistle written by the Apostle Paul. Now, I, verse 13, but now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So these are, these are saved people he's writing to, and his complaint against them is that they are not fruit producers. They're saved, but there's no fruit in their life. Look at 1 Corinthians 9 as another example of this. Now, if a man doesn't want to read the Bible, if a man doesn't want to be around Christians, if a man doesn't want to be around, you, you, you know, I, I, I personally will doubt his salvation. I'll have some serious questions for that fellow about his soul. Okay, so, so yeah, what are you going to do that? I don't know, do whatever. Say, well, you're a terrible person for thinking that. Well, I, it's all I have to go by. The Bible says how, you know, uh, how a babe will desire milk. That's the same way the Christian will desire the sincere miracle of the word. So if a person doesn't like the Bible, I'm assuming they're not saved. But if a person doesn't, isn't as involved as I think they ought to be, or as involved as I was when I was their point of Christian growth, or as involved as whatever, that doesn't mean they're not saved. And 1 Corinthians 9, verse 6. Uh, let's, let's, tell you what, let's start, oh boy. Verse 3. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or only, are I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth to warfare at any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say these things as a man, or say uh, 
Say not the law the same also. For it is written the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God not care for the oxen? And it goes on to some other stuff. But it's interesting that Paul is willing to, says in another spot, I think it's also in Corinthians, where he's willing to spend and be spent for the brethren, for the church. But also he wants, he wants to, you know, he, he wasn't too pious to expect something out of the lives of the people he had ministered to. And he called that reward fruit. Maybe this is another sermon for another time. But another glaring example that we're not even going to go to because I'm already 40 minutes into this or something and I, I haven't got to the fourth group, which I probably won't at this rate. Um, the most glaring example of this is the fruit of the Spirit, which everybody saved could have and everybody that saved should have, but apparently isn't automatic or Paul would not have to explain it to you. Right? So yeah, third group. Saved, but unfruitful. Now, I would say, by way of personal testimony, that when I got saved, my field was full of thorns. I was not the, uh, what must I do to be saved guy. I was more like the, you know, First Timothy 6, 9 guy. And, and that ain't bragging. I, mean, I, I, I like girls, uh, you know, pretty girls, ugly girls, whatever. I liked fighting. Just, you know, the, the cares of this world and the lust of other things. And when I got saved, I also did not prune my field right away. Uh, I have no excuse for that but myself. Uh, I didn't know some things were wrong. And when I did find out some things were wrong, I loved them too much to give them up right away. But God was kind and he was patient and he was gracious. So let's say that you are a thorn infested Christian. How do you bear the fruit that Jesus deserves to have from you? It's a fair question to ask. So let's look at John 15. John 15. Where is that at? It's right here. Uh, verse, we'll start at verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, that he purgeth it, may bring more for, for, forth more fruit. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Verse 4 is where I want to land at. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. And we're not going to chase all the stuff about purging. We're not going to chase the stuff about taking fruit away. We're not going to chase all those rabbits right there. But a man who, who abides in Christ can thrive despite a thorny beginning. Okay? So, you know, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. What's that other song? Um, abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless. Abide with me. So if you are in that third group, you've got a thorn-filled life. There's still hope for you. There's still hope in the, in the personal ministry of Jesus Christ to you as a believer and the personal ministry of the Holy Ghost to you as a believer and the care and, and extension of grace that God the Father will give you. God is on your side if you're saved. You try to do right. I say this. You try to do right. God will drop everything he's doing. Not that he needs to. God will drop everything he's doing and come help you. 44 minutes and change. We are not going to get to this third, this fourth group. Well, we will uh, milk this cow for one more podcast, I guess. Um, yeah. Thank you for listening, all four of you. This is Mike. This has been the Street Preachers Podcast. And I, as always, will see you on the other side.